I believe that everything that's happening to you happens for a reason and it's to make you a better person. So I always try to keep going as far as I can. If I can't anymore, that's the point where I stop. So I like meeting new people too. So you know, I like to help people. So if I need to, that just makes it easier a lot. Just knowing that if that person needs help, I can help them. And if I need help, I can go talk to them too. You're listening to season three of Seeking Refuge, a podcast sharing human stories of refugees. This week, we are examining the situation in Somalia. The conflict in Somalia started over 30 years ago, when several military groups began fighting for control of the central government. In the 1990s, Somalia was faced with a power vacuum so severe that the United Nations pulled its forces and declared a failed state. After a series of regional governments and extended fighting with extremist groups, the current constitution was signed in 2012. However, thousands of people are still displaced every year from radical attacks, natural disasters, and foreign intervention. Estimates put around 2.6 million people internally displaced within Somalia and 750,000 living in neighboring states Kenya, Ethiopia, and Yemen. Somali refugees have also been relocated to Western countries like the United States, where they often struggle to adapt culturally. Many different groups work to ease this transition for refugees as a whole. Others, like Athletics United in Logan, Utah, take a more focused approach. I sat down with co-founder Mike Spence to learn about how the little things can have a big impact. Here's that conversation. So to start, could you just tell me a little bit about Athletics United? Uh, so Athletics United, we started, uh, there's another organization in our community, uh, the Cash Refugee and Immigrant Connection. Uh, we became aware of the immigrant population, the refugee population uh, through them. And uh, I used to be a, a track coach at the local at Utah State University in our town. And I had recently stepped away from coaching, but was trying to find a way that I could use that skill set. Um, I'm a stay-at-home dad now. But, uh, but to, to try to build some bridges and community in our, our neighborhood. So that was the, the idea. I approached CRIC, that's their acronym, um, and they said go for it, and they helped coordinate um, a – we did a pickup. Uh, they were doing a mattress distribution for uh, refugee families in town, and we just set up a kind of impromptu track meet at the field that they were – setting up at and all the kids stayed and ran with us for about an hour after they had uh, picked up their their mattresses with their families and we just did sprints and, and ran around and timed them and they kept coming week after week that was our first we just wanted to see if there was an interest in the community and we went from there um started out with about a dozen kids i think the first uh, first practice and right before covid we had about 45 kids that would come usually between 40, 45 each practice. Wow. Okay. So it's pretty clear that you are very invested in running and community building. How did you learn how, like how long have you been interested in the refugee community in um, your area? So I have always been interested in trying to do something to make a difference in our local community. Um, through my own running career, I got to travel lots of different places, including uh, East Africa. And um, I did not know we had a refugee population in our town until I got to uh, talk with the, uh, the directors at, at Crick. Um, sometimes you think that those opportunities are by their nature, far afield and, you know, take a lot of uh, work to get involved in. And it's exciting when you open your eyes to what exists in your own community, your own neighborhood, but sometimes can be just beneath the radar and, uh, and is, is right available and, and that you can make a difference in your own, you know, in your own backyard. Um, so that's the, uh, I would say that I've always been interested in, making a difference in our community. Um, The refugee uh, stories in particular, um, it's a population that that, uh, um, is at risk of becoming disenfranchised or just ignored, not 
uh, being, you know, the, the fact that a lot of people in our community don't know that we have hundreds of refugees that live here. We're not a big town. We're about 50,000 people. It's not, not tiny, but it's not a, not a big town. And to have uh, hundreds of uh, refugee families that, that live in your neighborhood, that's important to know about. Um, running is just an easy way in my, it's one of the most, uh, you know, broadly participated uh, in sports around the, the planet. So there's no barriers to entry. There's also no uh, real, it's easy to, to go out for a run with someone you barely know and talk a lot, talk a little, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an easy way to get to know somebody. Um, there's not a whole lot of pressure on, um, you know, social pressure on either party when you're, you're out uh, going for, for a run with somebody. Uh, we work really with interesting. all yeah, so that's what we've found it. I've always found it as a great way to to make friends and get to know people from different walks of life. And so we were hoping that we could use that as a really running is our icebreaker to the refugee community. So do you then build connections with these kids that you run with and help them in other areas? Or is it just strictly a running club? No, it, running is, uh, is kind of a is really quite secondary. Um, the uh, running is just what gets us all together. The, uh, so the idea is that, um, and we're not, <laughs> we try not to intimidate anyone out of participating by thinking that we are strictly a running club either. That's even our title, Athletics United. Uh, we work with other sports teams at Utah State so that we have, uh, um, we had the tennis team come uh, practice with us one day last year. The basketball team was all set to come and participate with us right before COVID. So um, hopefully we can get that uh, back one day when we're able to, to resume normal meetings. But um, the, yeah, the um, kids that participate in the club go from about age four to high school. So uh, with the young ones, we just are out in the field Sometimes practice means you're pushing a little one on a swing and just, uh, you know, asking them how things are going. Uh, one of the best things about the club, we often would uh, carpool to practice. And so we would get to, uh, to talk with families a lot um, when we do pick up and drop off, um, when we're talking with the kids in cars. Um, and uh, it's, it's really good to, you know, whether you're, you're running or visiting, uh, you know, for tea after practice, uh, it's just, there's lots of opportunity to, to talk about what's going on. And that's when we really find what people need help with. Um, it's, you know, it, it comes from those conversations and the trust that you build just uh, in, in practice. And then we can, we try not to reinvent the wheel. We, we redirect wherever the resources already exist in our community, whether that's uh, knowing where to go to for a, a medical uh, procedure, uh, getting somebody connected with a dentist, um, or if a parent is trying to get their driver's license, making sure they know about the resources that CRIC offers already, um, you know, other job placement services in the community, and, and we're really trying to, to help use the, the community building time that we're spending out running to, to connect those dots and uh, make that a little less, less intimidating. Um, the kids that we work with, it's, it's easy, especially if your parents don't have uh, a great command of English, it's easy for them to, uh, to, to not participate in some of the, the, even something like a, like a sports team, you know, that growing up, I took for granted that, you know, I could just hop on a little league team or a soccer team and, but sometimes you need to fill out paperwork or get a physical for that to happen. And that, that can be kind of intimidating. So we'll walk them through that process so that they, they just are making sure that they're as engaged as possible uh, with, with all the, the athletic and academic opportunities that, that there are in the community. Sure. So based on what you're saying, are most of like the issues refugees have in relocation kind of like the small things, like the filling out forms, finding a dentist? Like, do you see a lot of that or do you see a lot of other issues? That's, no, there, there's everything. It, it, um, you know, it runs the gamut of, uh, from those small issues to the big issues. We usually help solve the smaller ones that, that are overlooked, but um, we, we deal with 
quite a few bigger ones too. Earlier today, I was uh, working on a, an individual crisis uh, that um, sometimes just by the relationships that you build, you end up being, uh, you know, a, an emergency contact with someone at school and uh, you'll help walk them through, um, you know, some of the issues that, uh, that, that, that come up. Uh, some of the kids have PTSD and uh, we want to make sure that they're, uh, that they feel like they have, someone on their side quite a few are here without their parents uh, and are living with a, a family member who who works pretty long hours so sometimes we'll do um if there's an emergency we'll help them out with uh you know even if it's just getting home from school um so yeah there there are some pretty big issues that that we have to deal with we try to again refer those to the the agencies that are best suited to to take care of them but you know, we, we learn a lot from the kids about what they and their families need. We started out as that running club, but now two thirds of our meetings are tutoring meetings uh, because uh, a lot of the kids wanted to just have some extra time uh, learning English, especially the kids that came at junior high age and are playing a, a little bit uh, quicker catch up to try to get their diplomas. Um, so we'll, we'll pair them with uh, either local tutors from Utah State University or uh, we have two teachers that lead that, um, two educators from the Valley here that, uh, that one is a special education teacher and the other is an elementary school teacher and they'll coordinate our lessons. And, uh, we would meet at the public library with a, a pretty big group of kids, uh, in the evenings twice a week before COVID. Now we do it remotely. So, yeah, you just kind of touched on that there. That's actually what I was going to ask next. How has COVID impacted your processes and just the general process of coming to a new country and trying to adjust? It's been extremely difficult. Um, we have not had a normal practice since March and we, uh, we really, we, like I said, we, we used to have kids down to, you know, preschool age at practice and um, we haven't been able to do that because <laughs> practice was a, uh, a fun uh, free for all a lot of the time. And like, like I said, there was running that happened to practice, but a lot of times with the younger ones, we'd be on the jungle gym or uh, um, there was, there's no social distancing that went on at our practices. So we, uh, we have had to uh, just meet with some of the older kids that can, can understand that. And, uh, and those kids are usually the ones that are, like I said, at, at the greatest risk of, uh, falling behind in school or needing a little extra help in, in, you know, some life skill category. So we meet with those kids still, uh, in small groups, uh, outside while the weather is holding. And, uh, we've been doing that, you know, since the, the summertime, we also try to stay engaged with families. Uh, the university has a couple departments that have been doing take home care packages. We've put together a couple of care packages, activity packages, uh, that we deliver to families. We use our volunteer network uh, that we've established to, to go around and, and just uh, do, you know, drop off deliveries so that uh, everything from sidewalk chalk, uh, playground balls to um, the anthropology department at Utah State puts together care packages about uh, the Olympic Games over the summer, um, arts and crafts that uh, the kids can do, world cultures. So we'll, we'll deliver those so that the kids uh, are still just having some contact and, and receiving they know that we're still thinking of them. Um, yeah. Our tutoring has gone all online. Uh, we can't bring the university community together with the refugee community right now. And that's, that's really difficult. That's our, I mean, that's our mission is, uh, you know, university students have an incredible impact on these kids. Uh, it, it really shows them, uh, it creates an opportunity for both sides to learn about what the other is going through in life, whether that's what it's like to be a college student or what it's like to be a refugee. Um, and we try to make sure that whenever we're doing our, our tutoring or our running club, that all of the learning is two-way learning and that it's not just uh, teaching refugees how to assimilate in the local uh, community, but making sure that our local community understands that we have a, a population that they can learn from as well. For you, 
like why do you think it's so important to establish these connections and have this like exchange and not just give people resources and then go away you kind of touched on it yeah the it's it's i feel like uh what we do and what all similar organizations do um you you build the fabric of of a community and uh if you have um yeah, I, I think that the more the more diverse that community is, the healthier it is. We really try to make sure that, yeah, like I said, the that all learning is is two way. I've learned not just about the refugee community through our organization, but when I find out about a need, I try to find out more about what resources we have to solve that. Um, I have learned and become friends with uh, leaders of so many other nonprofits um, and government agencies in our town. Um, you know, the, there's uh, the Utah Department of Health um, works closely with us to find out what, uh, because we're a little removed from the Salt Lake area. Uh, we're about an hour and a half north. And so a lot of the, the primary state agencies don't have a lot of resources up here. So they really count on us to help uh, let them know about what community needs are so that they can make sure that they're delivering their resources in the best way. Uh, we try to make sure that we, we just put people together. We have uh, liaisons for the community that have lived here a long time. So Somalis who came here 30 years ago who are now, um, you know, work uh, in local Actually, one of them works in government locally, and uh, we just try to make sure that they, they the, um, I think that I've learned more about community resources that are available. I've become closer with other community leaders who are trying to, um, you know, bridge those gaps and make sure that nobody, uh, nobody is left behind in the community in, in any regard, um, you know, whether that's uh Growing closer with, like I said, a, another nonprofit, um, uh, even some, uh, just our neighbors. <laughs> I've gotten to know some of the people who live a few doors down from me who I didn't know as well as I, I ought to have, but kind of want to know what we're up to and, and get involved and uh, bring, you know, whether they provide snacks for a running practice or, or provide tutoring or off of how many times they, they know somebody who's, uh, um, you know, a, a local dentist who takes Medicaid and is looking for new patients and, and helps get people set up so that their kids are um, just getting regular dental checkups. And um, all those nonprofits that existed long before us um, are, are all trying to, to kind of weave that, that fabric of the community. And, um, uh, but we are in touch with a group through, you know, through our, our tutoring and our running that, that um, is easy to, easy to lose track of. And so we, we try to make sure that they're, um, that that doesn't happen and that they yeah. know that there's uh yeah, but it's, it's important that our community understands who lives here too. It, every, you know, it's so easy to live in your bubble. Um, Absolutely. And I think that we're, we're all <laughs> uh, guilty of that at some point um, if we're not careful. And uh, I know I was, and that's what has been, I think, most rewarding to, to me is that I feel like I've really gotten to know, um, and again, beyond just the refugee community, just uh, uh, really gotten to know uh, more about what our community is comprised of and uh, what enriches it, uh, what its needs are, and, what, uh, and just how rewarding it can be to, to pull it all together. Absolutely. I appreciate the comprehensiveness of that answer and just have like one little more line of yeah. questioning in terms of the Somali community. How have you seen it change or is it growing as you've done these um, organizations and seen people come in and out of the community? It has grown. Um, you know, the, the refugee community is always changing based on, you know, what the uh, policies of, of our country are and where we're taking refugees from at a given time. Um, you know, I listened as part of, uh, I listened to your uh, interview about the Rohingya population 
uh, we have a big Karen population here uh, that came, you know, uh, years ago. And the, um, the Karen population has started to, it's been a little more established. Um, I think that it's, uh, I don't think it's growing at this. It was our fastest growing refugee population actually when we started just four years ago. And then it's kind of plateaued. Um, the East African and Central African populations are growing much faster right now. And yeah, we are always meeting new Eritrean families, new Somali families. Uh, we've had a few families come from Syria and, uh, you know, we always make an effort to introduce ourselves. I didn't mention we're, we're not just a refugee club. Uh, we actually tried to make sure that we don't define ourselves as that, even though we actively introduce ourselves to the refugee community. But our participants are not, you know, our, our people who've lived here their whole lives are not just the, the, um, the tutors or the coaches, they're the participants too. So we have um, Valley residents that have lived here for generations that uh, have their kids in the club. Most of the club is is refugees. Of that 45 that come, I'd say about 35 usually are refugee families. Uh, again, mostly from Eritrea or Somalia. But um, but we our hope as we grow is to to expand to include a, a broader section of the, the community, um, more of our you know the Central American immigrant community and uh, and more of residents that have lived here for generations. Okay. Well, that was honestly my last question too, is just to ask how you see yourself growing um, in the next like five or 10 years. Yeah. What we do is really scalable. It can, it can work anywhere. Um, it's pretty simple. The, we wanted to, we have not tried to grow too quickly. Um, what we really wanted to do is make it an organic process where we found you know, what works and what doesn't locally before we try to, um, to, to duplicate it in any other communities, even understanding that every community has their own needs and you're, you're always going to need to, to adapt and, and be able to, to, to change. But the, uh, we wanted to make it work here. And then, yeah, that's our hope. Uh, in the next five years, I'd love to see this grow to, to larger communities, to bigger uh, urban populations that have much larger refugee communities. Um, and there's, there's really no limit to how, uh, how big it could grow. It just needs people interested in it. After hearing about all of the programs Athletics United offers, we wanted to give you a first-hand account from one of the club's first members. Malid is a student at the local high school in Logan and moved to the States from one of the two autonomous regions within Somalia. Let's dive into his story. So just to start, tell me about yourself. What do you like to do? Um, like, what your favorite hobbies, things like that? Okay, so my name is Malik. I'm a student at Logan High in Utah. I'm a senior. I'm graduating hopefully this year. And one of my favorite hobbies to do is I'm uh, I like to play soccer and do track too. And then now I work, so that got on my way of doing a lot of activities. But I still try to do what I can to do to keep it active with activities and like that. Yeah, especially during COVID, it's no fun being bored. Um, I heard you're actually quarantined right now. I am actually quarantined right now. So. How long have you been in the U.S. again? I've been here five years, and I'm here in six months, I believe. So I came here in 2015, May 14. And can you tell us a bit about where you're from? I'm from Somalia. I think you know right now. I think you're, Mike already tell you I'm from Somalia. But I was in a refugee camp in Ethiopia, so I directly didn't come from Somalia to here. I came through Ethiopia and then from Ethiopia to Utah. Okay. And I moved a couple of times around these days. So. so what was it like those first couple months in the States? 
Oh, it was a little bit. It was sad, to be honest, mostly, because just family back then. And I was a kid. I was young that time. I was like 13 years old. So every time I didn't come here with my mom or my, my dad. I have one little brother. His name's a booster. He came here with me and my aunt. But my, my, my mom and my dad and my other siblings are still back then because they were not on the refugee camp. Because back then it was just hard for them to get a position. We were lucky enough to get in the camp. But so, so they didn't get it so that's why we got picked but then when i came here i was a kid so every time i hear every time i hear uh anybody that i know their voice or anything like that i will start crying out of know for the like literally the first five to six months straight then i finally got used to it and he was he came here like this winter was about to start too then we were like what is it snowing you're supposed to be rain and stuff like that so was just, Oh, I'm not a different world. Do you think it was harder since you were so young making that transition? Um, yep. I think it's like, especially when you're young, if you, like, especially when you leaving your family and stuff like that behind, if I would have came with my family, it would have been easier, you know, just to feel comfortable. And never, I still feel comfortable with my aunt and stuff like that, but it's just, better to have mom and dad with you. And then it's like, I only have one little brother here, but I have seven of them back there still. So it's like, it's not really fun, but I don't care as long as I have one of them in my life right now. But I hope they come here one day. Mm. Do you feel more comfortable here now? Have you found it yep. easier now, to connect? Yeah, now I feel a lot easier just because of the culture and stuff like that, different cultures, you know, I and mean, then there's a different language. We speak here English, but then we were Somali. So the first couple of months when I came here, all I see was people speaking different language. When I try to speak it, I can't because I haven't learned it. And when I came here, here, it was about at the end of the summer. So basically school was closing, so I couldn't make it to school to learn even a little bit to speak during the summer. And then people speaking, and I try to speak it. But then I was a teacher, so I, it was really difficult. But now I understand, and I just grew up learning and learning and learning by day. It just makes life easier right now here, better. Mm, yeah. So what is your favorite part of high school or American culture that you've found so far? My favorite part of high school would be meeting new people and trying new things. I'm more likely to be a open person to try new things. But when things, I'm going to be honest, when things get harder than I expected, I get to the point where I think about if I should give up or not. But mostly I try to keep going and see where it takes me. Because I feel like in my, I believe that everything that's happening to you happens for a reason and it's to make you a better person. So I always try to keep going as far as I can. If I can anymore, that's the point where I stopped. So I like meeting new people too. So like I like to help people. So if I need new people that just makes it easier a lot just knowing that if that person needs help I can help them. And if I need help I can go talk to them too. So it's really nice. Yeah, you sound like a really mature teenager. I don't think I would have been so eager to help people in high school so i respect you a lot for that so Thank you. now just tell me a bit about how you met mike here and how you got involved with the running club i don't exactly remember one model but I, I remember that was in summer 2017 if i'm not wrong or 16. yeah 17. I say that. It was day 17. It was a Muslim. So in our religion, there is a month that is called Ramadan. We fast for 30 days. And after that 30 days, we have a day celebration after the 30 days. So that, that day, me and my family, my, my family, my little brother too. And then there was our, uh, we had a Somali neighborhood right next to us. All of us went to the swimming pool because then we were literally we were kids. 
most of the people. We went to this swimming pool, uh, and then Mike was there. And him and his family, they were swimming. And when he saw us, everybody sat down, everybody was comfortable and stuff like that. He came up to me, and I believe there was my little brother and one kid that who moved to Minnesota, his name is Anna. And he talked about us, how he had this program, this early uh, track program that he would love us to enjoy. And back then I was still playing soccer. But then I was running too at the same time. So then I was like, oh, it was a nice opportunity to take it. So I'm like, just to get a better trainer, why not? It was a free opportunity. Boom. After that, we enjoyed it. He told us that it was, we were going to, I think it was, I believe it was Friday when we saw him. And we had a meeting on uh, Wednesday, practice. They, he gave us the location and he told us the time to come there. We came, we had fun, we were running, practicing, everything. It was, it was incredible. I can't even forget it. I mean, right there, day by day, we just meet him. And then me and him, we talked to him personally one day and he was like, uh, I see you getting better and better. Just to get it better and better, I would love to meet you every day, if that's possible. And I remember that we started from five minutes. Day by day, we were added five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. After we got to 50 minutes, and I couldn't tell that, that level. Then we still practiced, and then I got I started working, and then I got on my way. And I really didn't have enough time to run with them for like a year. But he was still training because there were new people coming to the club, they, and especially they were young. And now if you see them, they're faster than me too. Cause my all I can think about is that year I missed the train they got. And now a lot of them is much better than me now. And I'm so proud of I I relate to that. I used to run track and cross country, but I haven't done that in gosh, three years, four years. So I guarantee all of y'all would leave me in the dust. <laughs> For sure. Um, do you think? Do you think being part of this group helped you build a community in your time here? A lot, a lot. To be honest, right now, for example, Coach Mike is in my emergency contact at school. He's been in my emergency contact. At, I believe the past three years since I started high school. I really anything that has to do with me come straight to him because he knows that he understands everything better than if my parents, if I'm not doing it, but if I, for example, say, my aunt needs to sign this paper, he always says, let me, they always send it to him so he already knows it, what kind of paper it is. So all I have to do is just translate my aunt to uh, Somali and she understands and all I need her to do is sign. And Mike already understands better, much better if she understands because it's in English and it's kind of hard for me to translate to her. Somali, especially when there's a lot of different words. So then Mike, the thing is that with Mike is that everybody that I know in this town, Logan, especially with the black African community, literally everybody that I, if I say, for example, Coach Mike, everybody knows him. Since we started this class, we started from, I believe, like 15 people or 20 people, and not the, it's like, almost 50 kids, which is year by year, which has been growing a lot, a lot. And I feel like this club makes it a lot easier, especially we have the best coach right here, Coach Mike. That's super sweet to hear. So you talked about the community knows Mike. Is there a big refugee community in Logan? I would have said there would be a big, big, because it's a small town, it's called Logan, a small town. But compared to, for, if I would say, if I would have compared to Minnesota, it wouldn't be the same community, but we yeah, have pretty good enough African American people in here. So is it, I, I would call it medium, not large, small. Yeah, so do you think it's, easy or difficult to stay connected with your heritage or do you even want to? I, I would love to, yeah. 
I think it just makes it easier, perfect. Um, so then I just have a few more questions for you. Um, Mr. Mike was talking and he mentioned that you identify more with Somaliland. Is that correct? Yeah. That's yeah. True. So could you explain kind of the difference between that? Yeah. I would have explained that better before, but I didn't know he already explained it. But the difference between that is Somaliland and Somalia. So back in the 19th century, like almost 31 years ago right now, they separated each other because they had a war and they were not agreeing with each other a lot of things that was going between the countries. So then they decided to be separate. But then the flag, they have two different flags. Right now, I believe right here, that's my country flag, Somalia. And then the Somalia one is a blue one. So they're really, they, it's just that they separated. So that was one of the main reasons that a lot of people, if you if I would say that's the reason I said I'm from Somalia. Because if you look at in the map and you see Somalia, Somaliland is inside of the map of Somalia. So then you really would if you search it up. I, I believe right now it's on Google right now. I think Google had some to do with Somaliland right now. So I believe if you search it up Somaliland, you would see it. So before like a year or the past almost twenty years ago, you weren't able to see it because you said it's part of Somalia. Like it's like you saying United uh, United States but especially Utah part of Somalia, but now they separate it into people really having different capacities with each other. Some people hate each other, some people love each other. It's just, it's just a whole argument about it. Yeah, I've heard there's a lot of argument. Um, but do you think that people outside of Somalia and that area really know what's going on? Or do you think people just kind of don't really know the difference. I think that uh, let me say if there is there are Somali people, I think ninety eighty percent of the people might know what's going on inside Somalia because they basically there's a lot of people. For example, my grandma, she literally all the phone calls that comes to her is from Africa. If anything happens. It comes straight to her. It's like the BBC through the phone. So a lot of people, I think they have a bad, a bad on them. They have families back there and stuff like that that might have taught them or they might have looked at the news and stuff like that. But I think, I, I would say, yeah, 80% of people know actually what's going on back there or not. Um, and so this will be my last question, I think. What would you want? Americans and specifically the college students who will listen to this to know about refugees. We're just like them. Just back there, it was a safe for us. That's one of the reasons I came here. Because back there, it was a safe. And it's still to this day, it's not safe. But I hope one day it's safe. Especially my country, Somalia, than where I was born, it's safe there. But in Somalia, it's not. And it hurts me because it's just like I wouldn't consider myself I hit them or anything like that. There's no who swim them. I does they're both I love them. They're Somali people. They're human beings too. So that there is not safe because a lot, I heard that a lot of people when they think of the word Somalia, the first thing that comes to their mind is like war. Because there's a lot of war going on with uh in Somalia there's spies, a lot of stuff that stuff. So that's one of the reasons that's safe. So that's one of the things. I think most people think of that way. But I think it's a lot better than what people think of it. And one thing I'll say, it's a difficult question. Malid, you know, your coaches that practice are, where are they from? Our volunteer coaches. They're mostly students at Utah State, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, you have in most of our coaches, 90% of our coaches at practice are students. Uh, yeah. So 
students at the local university. And most of those students, we're not a big town, most of those students don't realize until they start working with Athletics United that we have a significant refugee population in our town. But we're not unique. Logan isn't so different than most other small towns in America. And there are refugee populations, whether it's from Somalia or Burma or, or you know, Syria, all throughout the United States. And if university students engage with their local communities, there are often opportunities like this. But organizations like Athletics United count on university students to, to be looking to be involved in their community. And it, it makes a big difference. I'll let you speak to it, but uh, what's it like to have an opportunity to work with university students on a regular basis? It's really nice. Too. It's like me working with you and uh, you're older than me. You have a lot of experience than me. So usually, especially at the, our club, I know for example, you used to always tell me to do this better. And what I put in my mind that so I'm like, you're doing this wrong. And now he's other, he already went through this training. So he knows how to get better and how this might affect you. So I'm like, I will try to do that. And it's like that. When we have, when we used to get, we still get volunteers by college students. They come, they love with the kids, they run with them. That just makes it a lot easier because they, I feel like the kids, especially when they have someone, for example, that's older than them, that show what's right and what's wrong, that just makes it easier for them because they know that thing is wrong, so they want to, they don't, they wouldn't do it. Except that they're still a kid that won't understand it. So for example, if I say, you're still in. If she does something wrong and she sees someone, like me, I'm doing the right thing, but she's doing the wrong thing. She would try to come do this, what, I, what I'm doing, that is right. So I feel like really having a lot of our volunteers makes it easier for us. Yeah, I really appreciate that answer. That's perfect, perfect to get, because we actually have a refugee population here in Colombia too. Um, but college students don't know about it. So that's what we're trying to do with this podcast is to just build community just like y'all are doing. Um, So just as a wrap up, is there anything else either of you would like to say about your story, your country, just anything at all? You can throw it out, anything you're thinking. Uh, The one thing, you know, um, Nathaniel, the, uh, in the same vein of what we were just discussing, a, a role for students and volunteers to play. Uh, Malid mentioned that I'm you know, a, an emergency contact uh, with his school. And I mentioned earlier that our, one of our main uh, objectives is to make sure that we are always keeping uh, our communication two way so that we're educating both directions. Um, And there is a role to get involved and make sure that schools and local governments understand uh, the unique uh, problems faced by refugee communities. And so we work really hard to make sure that, uh, that when I'm in there helping Malid tackle issues that he has to take care of for school, I'm spending the same amount of time trying to make sure that school understands what Malid's needs are or similar families of what they need to do. Um, anyway, that, that's a really important role and we rely again on our volunteers to, to kind of uh, play that role with uh, whatever their local network is. That was good. Okay, Malid froze, so <laughs> I kind of <laughs> a little bit, but uh, the, but yeah, the, that, that education with the schools is, is really important and you don't have to be somebody's emergency contact to, you know, a lot of university students uh, work or give time through tutoring or some other way that they, they interact with uh, or have younger siblings that go to school um, in a local school district. A lot of that, uh, that education um, goes upstream that way to make sure that educators, administrators, local officials understand what, what, simple things they can do to make, uh, you know, American life more easy to navigate for somebody unfamiliar with the system.
That was Mike Spence and Molid talking to us about their experiences with refugee community building. As a side note, we wanted to acknowledge that Utah has recently entered a state of emergency following a rise in COVID cases. Because of that, any in-person activities mentioned in the previous interviews have been suspended, and Athletics United is following all safety regulations. If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us in the comments below. If you'd like to get in touch, email us at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com. Follow us at Refuge Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for all the updates on our show. As always, a huge thank you to Maxi International House for making this show possible. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next one.